scholar Look like a martyr to marauders like Tartar Wise out slaughter, whack MCs order a plotter Original woman, decipher the womb Crown of creation, fruit of the planet, earth and the moon Peace, peace, peace. Welcome to another episode of Wise the Dome TV. Uh, man, today I um, have a, my brother and friend, um, organizer, author, um, intellectual, or, you know, activist. Uh, he wears many hats, man, and he's a great and genuine brother who does a lot for the people. Um, Dwayne Omawale, I appreciate you for coming through, brother. Yeah, appreciate you as well. I'm always happy to be here. Likewise, likewise, man. Um, so the first thing I kind of wanted to get into uh, was this whole, uh, you know, since Candace Owens was on the um, Breakfast Club and I would say even the Joe Button podcast probably a, a month prior to that. Um, and we also know about her firing uh, from her job and her falling out with, uh, what's the guy's name? I forgot his name, but the right wing racist that you know all right and so she it looks like she's attempting to go through uh a rebrand of sorts right and the what i don't understand is people within our so-called community uh the conscious community are you know seem to be falling for it and are pro Candace Owens at this point. And it seems like they are forgetting the fact that she was, you know, she once worked for Prager U. She's disrespected um, the victims of state sanctioned police violence. Uh, every time it happens, right. Um, she's, you know, mocked things like Juneteenth. I've even seen her say um, standing in front of two white men uh, um, in front of a, a, a all white audience, it seemed, that you know, black people need to get over slavery, but because she says a few things that they agree with, it, it's like, yeah, we're 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 going to welcome her back home. Um, like, what is your what is your whole idea on first the attempted rebrand by Candace Owens and how some people are, you know, seeming to go for it? I mean, it's just, it's unfortunate because when you're talking about how some people in the, the you know, conscious community are actually falling for it, it, it just made me think about the Ice Cube situation where Ice Cube was trying mm. to get a contract with Black America. And why I, I remember it, because I remember pointing out to people, wasn't this the same Ice Cube that Khalid Muhammad was saying melted on him? Why yeah. are we trusting him now when you know one of our great revolutionary Pan-African leaders already told us what Ice Cube was about? So I noticed we just continuously keep falling for the trap of because somebody has a little bit of clout, you know, there's some of a celebrity figure or well-known in the media, that if they say some things that we like or say some things that it seems like we might agree with or line on, we're willing to just, you know, jump on that and support them and forget everything else that we know about this individual, everything about their past. And I think a lot of it is just rooted in the fact that, um, you know, in the 1960s, when Quintel Pro, um, you know, regrouped and essentially destroyed the Black Liberation Movement in the United States, I think since then we've had a serious vacuum when it comes to real mm -hmm. you know, pro-Black leadership. So... You know, to me, I look at it as a lot of times we just grasp for whatever it is that we can get, whatever it is out there that seems to be pro-Black, you know, it seems to be conscious. And it's particularly a problem because, you know, something I've been pointing out to, um, you know, some brothers that I organized with is that the other thing that happened, too, in the 1960s, the mainstream media actually gave platforms to people like Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, like Malcolm X, you know, Mar Martin Luther King, uh, Huey Newton. Those type of revolutionary voices, they still exist in the community. You're not going to turn off Fox News or CNN and see them right. you know, <laughs> having those platforms. So that's the other part of it, too. I just I think we don't have the leadership. or the, the le What it is is we don't think we have the leadership within the community because we don't see that on a regular basis. So mm -hmm. what we see are people like Candace Owens. And I think it just creates a situation where we're desperate to you know grasp for whatever leadership we think we have. But Candace Owens, really, she's not a hit <laughs> at all. Because you know, the thing I point out to people is, you know, we often forget this about her, but you remember she had that foundation, the Blexit? Oh, foundation? yeah, I remember Blexit, yep. Yeah, we forget about that because right. the whole goal of the organization was to get African-Americans to leave the Democratic Party and become Republicans. Become Republicans, yeah, I remember. And it failed horribly. So my thing is, why would we, follow, why would we ever follow <laughs> Candace Owens? Because the only solution or program she's ever put forward is leave the Democratic Party and join the Republican Party. And she hasn't even been successful at that. But outside of just leaving one, you know, political party for the, for not for not a party 
what is she actually offering the community in terms of a solution, in terms <laughs> of a program? So to me, I, just, I look at her, and this is also why I mentioned Ice Cube. To me, she's just an entertainer. Yeah. You know, she's not, mm-hmm. not necessarily a musician or an actor, but what she does is a form of entertainment. There's no real political insight in anything, you know, that, that, that she does. Because I even remember, um, you know, watching a clip where she's trying to defend colonialism in Africa, something positive. Like, she has no idea about any of the topics that wow. she's talking about. Not yeah, I saw her do the same thing with uh, she was on when she was on Rogan. He asked her about uh, climate change and why she was against why she was against the idea that uh, you know humans are affecting the climate and global warming and things of that nature. And she was just like she didn't have an answer. She was she was just pretty much to the idea of this is what the party says. So this is what I'm saying. Right. And, you know, I think you're absolutely right. And hit the nail on the head is the fact that she is an entertainer. Right. And people are because they are entertained by some of the things and the, the circus that comes with a, a Candace Owens. It's like, they forget that they're actually being entertained and really feel like that they're being educated and like what I what I try to do sometimes is point out like real sisters who are actually doing real scholarship and real work and in a lot of cases like people have never even heard of them you know and so when we look we know what the Fox News of the world are going to do we know what the CNNs and all of these um uh, you know, platforms are going to do. And you are exactly right when you talked about Stokely, uh, you know, Kwame Ture, um, Malcolm, and, you know, uh, all of these different, um, you know, radical uh, thinkers being on mainstream, uh, you know, broadcast back in the day. You're absolutely right about that not happening now. But when it comes to Black platforms that are extremely big, like a Joe Button like a um a breakfast club do you feel like they have a responsibility to do better if you're go- like like you know they're platforming people like uh obviously like Candace Owens um s- other scammers within the community that you know kind of cosplay uh you know uh black power instead of really reaching out to real organizers, real black academics. Like, do you think they have a um, uh, a responsibility to do better with that? Because I feel like sometimes in a lot of cases, a lot of the people that follow these people are, are well-meaning people. They just don't really know any of the alternatives and people who are doing the real work and people who are sincere about this. And that's why I made the point before that I think a lot of it is just rooted in the fact that there's a leadership vacuum. A lot of people just, you know, we're looking for, you know, some type of leadership, some type of guidance, you know, given the situation that we're facing, the circumstances that we're facing. So people just grasp for whatever it is that they think looks revolutionary, looks, you know, pro-Black. And, you know, the thing about the platforms that you mentioned, I personally wouldn't look for that from those platforms because I understand what they're about. It's about entertainment. It's the same thing with, with uh, what Shannon Sharp is doing now recently mm-hmm. too. Like uh, all these platforms are more or less entertainment, more or less celebrity gossip. You just, you go there, um, you know, make controversial statements, <laughs> engage in gossip, and then people mm-hmm. talk about them on social media for a week or two. Like the same thing with Candace Owens. All, all the discourse about Candace Owens that's gonna be forgotten by next week. Right. We're gonna move on to the to the next cycle. So you know. That's the reality of the world that we live in. It's the social media age. So those platforms, in my opinion, feed into that. You know, these are just entertainment platforms where people go there, have these interviews, you know, do um, these sound bites, and then you know we have discourse about it for a week or two on social media, and then we move on and forget about. It. And that's why I made the point with Candace Owens is that you know what 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 are what is her solution? What are her programs? And you know, to me, when I'm talking, when I'm looking at any type of leadership, historically, you know, historical or contemporary, those are the things I look for. How do you analyze the problem that we're facing? How do you how do you identify the problem, and what are your solutions? Are you developing programs that you're implementing to um, address the problems to implement the solutions that you claim we need as a people? Um, probably the best example is Marcus Garvey. Mm. And Marcus Garvey was very clear on this is the problem, this is the solution, and he made the connection between this is the work that we're going to do to reach the ultimate solution that you know Garvey was preaching and. 
So you know, to me, we don't see that with a lot of those voices, a lot of the voices that people look to. And I can add Kanye West to the list too. I see a lot of people, <laughs> you know, look look at Kanye West as he's some kind of conscious, you know, thought leader mm-hmm. in the community that he's um, you know, speaking speaking out against the system. Um, you know, people put <laughs> Kanye in that category as well. And the thing is, what is Kanye actually doing for people? Right. Right. I can say that's about a lot of celebrities that people elevate to that level and really listen to because they think these celebrities are conscious. And to me, I, it always comes back to, but what are they actually doing? What are they actually trying to implement in, in the community? And a lot of them aren't doing that. So, you know, to me, that's just the problem. That, you know, so much of so much of this is really just entertainment at the end of the day, but because a lot of us don't know how to differentiate between, you know, genuine leadership, genuine scholarship, and the entertainment, we just get caught up in the entertainment and, and it's difficult because you know, we live it's in a social media era and it is everywhere. entertaining yeah yeah and, yeah and even the mainstream media platforms a lot of them do it now too yeah oh yeah absolutely they're kind of they're kind of following they they see media changing and they're kind of going with it you know uh, and that kind of leads me to like the second part of this so you know uh she got fired um uh from her uh from her uh uh, her job what, what was the i, I got to look it up because it's, it's going to bother me um uh she got fired um from uh yeah the daily wire and with Ben Shapiro and uh you know now her and Ben Shapiro are at odds right but what does that say like you know cuz Matter of fact, I, before I even ask that, so do you remember the um that one sellout sheriff that they used to have uh on Fox News all the time during? Yeah, I, forgot. Yeah, yeah, I, forgot yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. even remember his name, but I, the, the, about, right. I forgot everything about that. Yeah, yeah. So and so, but whenever they were through with him, they let him go, and you know, publicly shamed him. Like so, when it comes to selling out, right? I mean, don't we have enough historical evidence to see that even if you wanted to be a sellout, that's not really a long term. That's not really a long term position because when they're done with you, they're going to be done with you. There's no retirement benefits. <laughs> yeah, there's no four hundred one k for being a coon. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> and it, it's so deep because you know, <laughs> even just on a governmental level, like we've seen in Africa, so many situations where African dictators who were backed by the West, particularly during the Cold War, when the Cold War ended, like for uh, Mobutu, for example, when the Cold War ended, he wasn't of use to the West anymore, so they stopped backing him, and that's you know one of the reasons why he was overthrown. So yeah, we just see that throughout the history that you know you're only there to serve a purpose, and when mm-hmm. you're no longer useful, they'll you know very quickly remove you get you up out of there and and, and it's, it, it's like a machine you know just get you out of there and put the next one in place and the machine keeps going and you know when when you're when done with you just discard you and put the next one in yeah yeah no absolutely man um kind of uh on a, along the same lines because i mean it's tough out here man um and sean king you know recently uh you know took his shahada shahada and converted or reverted to Islam. And, you know, after that, we were seeing flyers of, you know, him with these, you know, speaking engagements uh, at Islamic events and charging these crazy amounts of money. And he's, you know, he said that he was inspired, obviously, uh, uh, to uh, revert to Islam because of the strength he saw uh, from the Palestinians. But obviously, he has drawn a lot of criticism with the way he's, I mean, he's been drawing criticism before this, right? This is just another thing to add uh, to the list. But what are your, like, ideas and what are your thoughts on, like, you know, individuals who exploit social justice movements uh, for personal gain? Like, even when I had um, Dr. Hood Scholar on uh, last week, and he was talking about how Black Lives Matter did that in Ferguson, right? Um, I know it's personal to him because he was on the ground with the whole situation. Exactly, right? And so, like, so what? What are your thoughts on this? This idea where these people come in, the Sean Kings of the world, they're seeing that all eyes are on Palestine right now. So now he, you know, reverts to Islam, begins to charge money for these events, and he does it all in the name of solidarity with Palestine. It's exactly what I was saying before, that you, 
that, that's why it's important to you know study your history and to develop um, a standard by which we judge people who present themselves as leaders in the community. So that, same thing with Sean King, same thing with Black Lives Matter. What is the program? What is the solution? And how do we get there? So my primary criticism of Black Lives Matter has always been that it's mainly just a protest movement. You know, black men get shot by the police. We go march, chant Black Lives Matter, and then sit down and wait till it happens again. It's just you know, mm. a cycle. So with Black Lives Matter, I've never really seen that proactive, you know, program in place as to you know what what are we actually going to do to change things? What are we actually going to do to protect our people? We know with, with the Black Panther Party, they made it very clear, you know, what they were going to do to protect you know our people. Mm-hmm. But with Black Lives Matter, I don't really understand what the program is, what the plan is. And part of the problem is that organization was always very decentralized. That, right. That's part of why it spread so quickly because it was decentralized, but because it's decentralized, just it, there's no real movement. Everybody in Black Lives Matter is, you know, is essentially doing their own thing. And now with, with Sean King, you know, you know, to me, I was, I always viewed him as an opportunist in that way because his whole platform was built off of the same thing that Black Lives Matter was built off of just stirring up outrage every time a black person is killed by the, the police, but not necessarily actually doing anything about it or implementing a program to really do anything about it. To just give speeches, donate to you know this cause. And I remember um one of the issues with him was um he was trying to do um the North Star newspaper. Yeah, he I was remember. taking money for that, and there were just all kinds of issues mm-hmm. with that. People that worked with him um left the project, accused him of you know being a fraud, um, mismanagement. And we're seeing the same thing with this um, Palestine situation where um, there was an incident where he claimed that he was involved in helping to release some hostage through negotiations with Hamas. And the family of the hostage came out and said Sean King was lying, you know, he wasn't involved. And it was just one of the situations, like, you know how bad it looks when you're out here saying that you're trying to help the Palestinians and there's family members who are actually involved in the situation saying that you're lying on them for clout. Right, right, right. Now, see, and that's that makes you look extremely bad, right? Like, and and but see, that's and that's my thing too. Is I don't understand. To I think you have to be a really low down type of person to be to want to exploit the things that are happening in this world in these different anti imperialist movements, and people are dying, and people are, uh, uh, you know just out of doors and hungry and all of these different things and do see an opportunity in that for personal gain, man. Like, like even with, and like, even going back to Candace Owens, like, that's what I'm saying. Like with the rebrand to me, you can't come, like for me, you can't come back from that. Like, like I'm only one person and I don't make those rules, but for me, I, I'm not ever going to look at you like, like, you're one of us because like somebody was asking me when I was talking about it, somebody was asking me like, well, you know, what about the rappers and stuff that, that, you know, speak a lot of, you know, violence and misogyny. And I, and I get it. Like, that's not, you know, that we have to do better with that as well. But the difference I I see with, especially with a lot of the young ones that they're talking about, they're not claiming to be political. They're not claiming to be a part of the movement. It's easier for somebody to be young, you know, 18 to 22 and and young and wild. And, you know, they come across a brother like yourself and and or maybe one of your books and and they read it and and um, and like, oh, OK, you know, like I, I'm I, I, I maybe I want to, you know, begin to get knowledge yourself and, and live a different type of life. These people already have access to all to all you know, all of that type of information and they still choose to side with uh, either the grift or Europeans or both. And for me, it's like, it's a, it's a difference between a young man who was coming up, not really exposed to a whole lot than some, than like these people, you know what I mean? Definitely. And, um, Particularly with Candace Owens, because she she's been in certain spaces. She you know she's had conversations with people, so there's no excuse on her part to say she's not exposed to certain uh, types of information. You know, she knows she's in these, she, she's in these spaces. She has more access to this information than the type of people that you're talking about. You know, mm-hmm. the type of that um that you're talking about. So to me, there's no she doesn't have that excuse. But our problem with Candace Owens is when you're talking about you know how, how do you come back from that? Is she even trying to come back from that? Yeah, right. To me, what that would look like is actually mm-hmm. coming out to saying, you know, all, all the positions I said, said before, because, again, to give a historical example, you know, Ma- Malcolm, 
when he switched his position after he left the nation of Islam, he actually came out and said, hey, I'm switching my positions. This is why I thought my you know, my previous views were wrong. Martin Luther King did the same thing when he spoke out against the Vietnam, Vietnam War. One of the things he engaged in was a self-criticism, saying that mm. it was wrong for me to be silent as long as I've been. So, again, when we're talking about standard of leadership and how do we assess leaders, are you willing to be self-critical? Are you willing right. to say, okay, I had you know these prior positions, these positions are wrong, this is why I've changed, and Obviously, we can't assume we're not getting that reflection. We're not getting the, okay, well, everything that I said before I stood for in the past um, was wrong. And I don't even know to what extent she actually is even willing to make that break or to make that change because you just look who she's married to. Yeah, absolutely. And you, she's, you, she's still in that marriage. So yeah. Just, you know, and not, not to get, you know, to get into people's personal business like that, but to me, marriage is a big part of, you know, ass- assessing where you are politically. So if we're looking at, you know, a black woman, African woman, and she's spewing all kinds of white supremacists on talking points, mm-hmm. saying all kinds of negative things about her people. And she's married to a white guy. Now, to me, if she's completely switching her political positions, how do you then maintain that same marriage that you were mm-hmm. in when you have that consciousness? And I, again, I could give a historical example. Amiri Baraka, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. when, he, when he became a black nationalist, he actually left his white wife because he felt like it was a contradiction to be a black nationalist and to be Absolutely, yeah. to a white person. So that's part of it, too, you know. If Candace Owens really is trying to make that break and to change politically, then shouldn't that be reflected in her personal life as well? You know, she's talking pro black in these interviews, but shouldn't she be pro black in your private life if that's really the break that you you know you're trying to make? So you know, to me, I don't, I haven't seen anything from Candace Owens that to me would indicate she's even actually trying to um to atone for you know the, the previous positions that she's um made and try to actually come back into black community yeah you know uh two things and then we can get off of her but one th- one thing it was hilarious where on, <laughs> on the breakfast club like you could tell like she's not ever really around black people because they asked her they asked her so finish this sentence and it was like god is good and you know black people in the south know everywhere like all the time right whether you're a christian or not you've heard somebody say that and she was like um Amen. Like you know what I'm saying. Like, nah, you never been around. You don't even watch anything. You don't. You're not even. You haven't absorbed anything in regards to just the nuances and subtleties of black culture because you're not around it. Secondly, she asked. I mean, they asked her um, about you know having a white husband, and she said that something to the effect of that women tend to date like where their IQ is. Like, and so what is that implying, right? And like, and this is the interview that people are saying, like, yo, we need to welcome her home. Like, did y'all, like, are y'all, y'all are really just picking and choosing um, because I, I, I don't get it, man. Um, one yeah, thing. I, I didn't watch the full interview, but from, from the clips that I saw, I just, it, it was very obvious to me that she's not somebody who spends a lot of time in the, the black community. No. Even because the clip I actually saw was a clip that everybody was praising where she's talking about, you know, black culture. And she just seems so uncomfortable talking, but it was like a white person trying to talk about black culture. Like, <laughs> right. You can tell she's not talking about culture; she actually engages them <laughs> right. regularly. Right. And it, it reminded me of um, like the vice president Kamala Harris. You know, when she when she tries <sighs> to talk about hip hop, it's the same thing. Like I remember one interview where she was asked, you know, who who does she think is the greatest rapper alive? And she said Tupac. And the interviewer you interviewer had to remind her, well, no, Tupac's been dead for. Yeah, time. yeah. She even said like she was like. Yeah, because she was like, they, and they also, they were like, uh, who are you listening to in college? And she was, uh, no. Yeah, it was something, no, it was something like that. Well, she, she said in college she was listening to Tupac and Snoop Dogg, and then people went back and checked the records. Yeah. And they realized when she was in college, that was before their, their first album <laughs> even came out. And then she, she even said some stuff like she grew up in hustle celebrating Kwanzaa. Right, right. Even though she grew yeah, up in hustle. Yeah, I heard So, yeah. so it, it just, <laughs> listening to Candace Owens talk about black culture just reminded me of that. Like somebody who clearly has not been raised around black culture and doesn't have an actual emotional attachment to it. Mm. It's just rhetoric. I, I'm, I'm glad you said that emotional attachment because I think that's important. That's big when it comes to just who we are as a people. I mean, if you don't love who we are, our cultural expressions, our history, um, our movements, the things that are ideas, uh, because, you know, like, and Obviously, all of this is diverse. It's not just one thing that you can pinpoint. But whenever we just look at who we are as a totality um, at home and abroad, and if you don't, if you don't have, if you don't really, if you don't really connect with that and have any love for that, the people will be able to tell. Um, 
one thing I, I didn't get a chance to to put on the run sheet that I sent you, but I gotta ask you because it's crazy, and it's 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 so. <laughs> I guess we can conclude that for uh, a, a many many Europeans in this country, DEI is the N word, <laughs> and the fact that. It went from CRT, DEI. I feel like something before CRT. And somebody had um, posted a, a a clip of no, it was a it was a part of a it was a, a screenshot from a book where it was talking about in the fifties and sixties. You know, call us the N word to our face. But after that, that be that became less socially acceptable. So they find new ways um to say it right and like like it's funny like um i don't always rock with uh a lot of the stuff he says but um that uh that uh brother uh bishop uh what's his name bishop uh uh i'm about to find it bishop uh Talbert swan right and he was like um he was like you know like all the things that uh you know mean the n-word to these people he said what he say? law and order uh uh personal responsibility handouts socialism marxism affirmative action chicago urban critical race theory woke and dei and it's so and it's so like it's 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 funny because we already know what time it is um but like what are your thoughts on this whole idea that they are so out in the, especially on these uh, social media sites, especially on these like news channels as well, where because the, they use the same, they use the same language and they use the same rhetoric on mainstream, uh, you know, mainstream news channels and and things of that nature, and even like uh, Joe Rogan, uh, he has the biggest platform, the biggest uh, podcast in the world, and you know I saw clips of, and I'm obviously I'm no. Um, Joe Biden fan or anything, but he had uh, you know clips where he was talking about um, uh, you know Biden having a lot of diversity in his in his you know cabinet was was you know is something that was I guess the whole DEI thing right like that nobody deserved to be there um, and so do you think that Europeans in this country really believe? that america operates as a meritocracy like they really got there from their merit and their hard work do you think or or, or is this just like something that they are, are they just trolling <laughs> you know what i mean so i think it might you know i'm gonna have to get into some get into some marxist um, rhetoric here because i think it might be a class thing where the europeans that really believe that might be you know the, the poor you know working class uh, Europeans who believe if I work hard enough I could be a billionaire as mm -hmm. well. The ones who are billionaires who got there, they know how they got there. They know <laughs> you engage in hard work to become a billionaire. You, right. you got there because other people hard work. So right, right. That's thing they know, but but that's part of the game that they run. That you know this, this is a, a meritocracy. That if you work really hard in America, you can make a lot of money. And I mean, I just I know from my personal situation that the most money I've ever made was off of the least amount of work hmm. that I've done. Facts. Same here. Yeah, that, Same that's here. just how yeah, that's how the capitalist system works. The, the system operates that way. So you know, just it. And, and I mean, it, just, even from a historical standpoint, you're talking about these are the people who went all the way to Africa, <laughs> captured us, and brought us here so we could do the work. Right. <laughs> right. And, and there were no airplanes back then. So, you know, it was a pretty <laughs> long ride to get to Africa and to come back just so you know Africans could work for them. So that's the thing you're talking about. You know. Just from a historical standpoint, these are people who have never actually built anything off of their own work. And even, I mean, we're talking about, you know, the European enslavement of Africans, but just even look at what Europeans did to each other. When we talk about ancient Greece and Rome, a lot of people don't realize these were two of the largest slave societies in human history, um, Athens and Rome. So what that meant was within these European societies, the European ruling class was enslaved, enslaving other Europeans and having them do the labor. So mm. just historically, even among themselves, these are people who their ruling class has never been, you know, one to actually engage in labor. They'd much rather profit off of other people's labor. And, you know, part of why I mentioned Marxism in this context is because that whole 
ideology developed out of the fact that European history is just based on one class exploiting the labor of another class, whether it's slavery, Absolutely. feudalism, mm -hmm. capitalism. So that, you know, Marx was talking about how how do we overthrow that? And what we found out is part of why it's so difficult to have that Marxist revolution, particularly in Western countries, is because that's so deeply ingrained in European culture that it's just that's not something that Europeans want to get rid want to get rid of or, or to overthrow it to the point where socialism, communism, Marxism, those are the evil words in American politics. To, to the point where it's funny to me, if you're campaigning, all you have to do is say that your opponent is a socialist, he's a Marxist, or you know, use that kind of re rhetoric and some like that, that person's evil now. I don't even want to you know, Yeah, yeah, anything. they oh yeah, they, yeah, they, they flip out. Right. <laughs> right. No, you're right. It's 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 definitely a bad word to them. And but I, I just it's always it, it always you know just makes me laugh because um to have as you mentioned to have you know 250 years of enslavement and then and then uh Jim Crow and uh and not and 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 not even just that um you know the I you know things uh, such as you know the black towns townships and and uh, neighborhoods that we had, you know, coming out of Reconstruction, um, even in some cases up into the fifties, sixties, like they they found a way to eat, to destroy them. Um, whether they put freeways through them, whether whether they you know, uh, um, whether they put uh, 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 bombed them like in Tulsa, uh, you know, just all different types of things. And also, whenever we look at education, um, we were locked out of education for, for years. You know, we are, Black people in the South, uh, freed, you know, descendants of, of, of Africans who were enslaved in the South are the ones that actually spurred the movement to have a public school system in the south that they would later would become uh you know locked out of in many ways and even when we were doing those creations i mean creating those schools you know people like the uh the carnegies and and the rosenwalls and they were they were hell bent on just wanting to teach us how to be you know workers and 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 farmers and nothing else they said you know we have to learn to know our place in society and so we look at all of these things and the prison industrial complex and and just all of these different things and it just amazes me how they really can feel like they are where they are off of their merit it just makes it just doesn't make any sense like and then i started realizing Many of them, um, a lot of them, really don't know anything about history. They're not really intelligent people at all. Um, they, what they do is they memorize talking points that they get from, you know, their echo chambers, uh, and they just keep it there. But when it comes to understanding anything about how this country came to be settler colonialism enslavement uh the connection between capitalism and slavery uh the foundings uh, i mean the foundation of capitalism which was feudalism like they don't really they don't really engage in any of that so they live in this bubble that is protected by their whiteness right like this is really all they need in this society to feel like everything is okay which is why in a lot of cases they vote against their own interests as long as black folks or anybody else won't get won't get whatever it is that's on the table and it's just like man like sometimes do you ever wonder like damn like how like this uh that's that's like some crazy levels of inception like you ever wonder like how did how did they get to this point where because you know, like white hegemony infects everything that it that it uh, that it touches, right? And there's not there's no aspect of society that it does not, you know, touch. But that also means that it infects the European as well with a delusion that they are the uh, they have this like 
paternalistic idea of the world where where they're here to bring civilization. They are the standard of civilization. They are the standard of what it means to be human. Um, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't want to. I don't want to rant or anything. But like, like I don't know. This it's just weird to me. Like, what are your what are your thoughts on that? It's really deep because um, you know, something that I've mentioned um in public before that actually I, I grew up in um going to a mostly white private school, Catholic school. So I saw firsthand how white children are actually indoctrinated with this white supremacy because when you're in a Catholic school, it's a religious institution. So God is white, Jesus is white, Mary is white. I remember when I was at school, actually, this was funny to me as a student because they painted a mural mm -hmm. where it's God and he's holding all these different races to show that, you know, the, the human race is diverse. What color do you think God's hands were in the painting? White. White. So Absolutely. All Figures are white, but it's a school now, so the entire curriculum from top to bottom is white. World history is European history. When we do music class, music class is really just classical European music. Um, when we do foreign languages, all the foreign languages that are offered to me at the Catholic school were European languages. French, Latin, and Spanish were, were three. So the entire curriculum reinforced your Euro European um, identity. You you know do science class. The, the whole course is just the history of scientific inventions and discoveries that white people have made. Uh, you do math and all the mathematical um, theorems are named after uh, the Greeks. So. As a white student coming up in this environment, because it's a mostly white school, I just happen to be one of the few black people that are there. This curriculum is not for me. Mm -hmm. But as a white student, what you're learning is you're the superior race, that you have this glorious history, you've accomplished everything throughout history. God looks like you, the angels in heaven look like you, every, everything revolves around you. And you're being indoctrinated into the sense of white supremacy because you're being taught to you know think that my culture is superior and you're not even getting any other you know cultures you know really um in my experience in you know Catholic school from kindergarten to um to high school we touched a little bit on Chinese civilization nothing on African civilization and you know I saved my world history textbook from high school and I went through it when I became more conscious about history there are two chapters in the entire book in African history and both of them are half the chapter. So the one chapter was half Native American civilizations, half uh, African civilizations. And then the other chapter was ancient um, African civilizations. And Egypt is not even located in the African civilization part. It's located in the Middle Eastern Of course it is. Right, right. So, <laughs> so here's the thing. The, the school system is actually teaching you that you you have a you know great history, a glorious history, um, all these historical accomplishments. And African people have never done anything in history. African people were just slaves. And even the way slavery was taught, taught to us, African people were enslaved. And then Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and Africans are free now. We didn't have anything to do with it. And mm -hmm. then when I got to high school and it became more um, more uh, global in terms of the type of history they're teaching us, we even got the history of the um, ab 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 abolition of slavery in the Caribbean now. So how that was, was Africans in the Caribbean were enslaved. And then a white man named William Wilberforce fought to free African people, and this great white man saved um, the enslaved Africans. Again, we had nothing to do with it. The Haitian Revolution never happened. And in fact, I remember when I first found out about the Haitian Revolution, I was in college, and I remember thinking, you know, we spent so much time on the American Revolution and the French Revolution. This revolution seems like a more genuine revolution to me than those two, because this revolution I was actually talking about, you know, Freeing <laughs> slaves and establishing actual racial equality, like the Haitian you know, Revolution actually established that there's no racial hierarchies in Haiti. So this was a genuine humanistic revolution, and it was never even a footnote anywhere in the text. So I came out of that experience where that's exactly how you know what white kids are being indoctrinated. And I say indoctrinated because the history they're receiving is not even it's not even accurate um, history because it just it, it, it's very romanticized in terms of how it treats Europe. So you know that's why I made the point about you know, Romans and Greeks being slave societies, because somehow when we were learning about the greatness of the Roman Empire and Greek democracy, slavery just, it wasn't mentioned. The Spartans, the Spartans were, and I was in high school around the time the 300 movie came out, so the Spartans were these brave, mm -hmm. noble warriors. Spartans were thugs. They would right. go and conquer people and Rapist. slave them and force, yeah, all, all of that. So we never got asked of like, Greco-Roman history and um. You know, last year I sent a, a brother in the organization I, I work with. Um, Jabril actually gave him a shout out. Yeah, yeah, know. my boy. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I sent Jabril um a video. It was the top ten torture methods that the Romans used, and he watched it. And we were just having a conversation about how 
like for us, we couldn't even if he told us to actually sit down and come up with a very brutal, horrific way to, to torture somebody to death, we couldn't even do it. And these people got top ten lists. So you know there's more than ten top ten. Yeah, this is just the best. This is just the ones that went platinum. So, so that's the thing. He's saying how you know these people are really evil geniuses, but, but again, we we never got the history. And here's the ironic part. I came out of a Catholic, Catholic school, right? So crucifixion was on the top ten list, and somehow the school never made the connection between you know the Romans crucified Jesus because this was just a regular practice. Like this is how barbaric mm-hmm. these people were. That they didn't just want to kill you; they wanted to make it as painful, humiliating as possible. And the thing is, and make a spectacle out of it. Make a spectacle. So the thing about you know Jesus crucifixion, you know, he died relatively quickly in the gospel account of being crucified because they you know beaten him and tortured him so badly he basically bled out. In most situations, when you when you got crucified, you were there for a few days, and mm. like you said, it's to be a spectacle. So they basically crucified you and left you up there to die. So when people walk by, they know that this is the Roman Empire. Don't don't mess with us because you're gonna end up here. And um, Spartacus, when Spartacus led his um slave rebellion, they crucified hundreds of slaves and just lined them up, mm. you know, to, just to, to make an example. And like I said, we never got that history mm-hmm. going through high school, but that's that's part of who these people were. That's part of, you know, the European history that, you know, it's just very brutal. And like I said, this is not even Europeans crucifying and torturing African people. A lot of the times, this was Europeans even doing it to other to Europeans. Themselves. Yeah, right. And, I, and, I, and another point that we never got, um, part of what, what I did as well in, in literature, we did um, Greek mythology. And, you know, somehow they, they skipped over the fact that Zeus, who's the most powerful god, the greatest of the Greek gods, was a rapist. Mm, uh, right. uh, he was right because that's how he yes. got the the demigods that were what was his son's name I, and i forgot i forgot but yeah go ahead go ahead yes yeah, so, so exactly so you know this was a rapist and then you get to the medusa story and medusa is very you know, very popular in um western popular culture american culture everybody knows but medusa you know she's got snakes for hair and she looks at the you know, man the man turns into stone and the part that i didn't know about until i really got into you know researching history that was actually a punishment because she got raped by Poseidon. So mm. she got raped by another god. And, and then she's she gets punished, punished for it. being raped. So, I mean, right there in the Greek mythology, all kinds of rape and abuse. And, you know, but that never flipped that. their values of, at the time? Like, But but, but, but this, this is the point I make that mm-hmm. this is their gods. So yeah. in, in most cultures, the, the gods or, or God reflect the highest um, aspirations, the highest <laughs> ideal of a people's <laughs> civilization. So when people, you know, develop <laughs> religions, God is supposed to re- represent your highest aspirations, you know, the, the best of humanity. These are their gods. <laughs> These are the Greco-Roman gods. This is before Christianity <laughs> got into Europe. So that's what I mean. When I was in school, we studied it, but it was always from a glorious, romanticized part of it. We never actually got into the details of what this actually is. And you know, as, as I said, you know, these gods, you know, these gods were rapist gods. And then Christianity got into Europe, and you know, they, they skimmed over this. Uh, although you know, it, it was discussed because when, when you're in Catholic school, and you talk about the history of Christianity. It's very difficult to avoid the Roman persecution of Christians. But when Christianity came into to Europe, this is a religion preaching a message of peace, and the Roman reaction to it is. Let's kill these people. Let's torture them. Let's feed them blind. <laughs> right, right. That's crazy. I remember um, reading a, reading a book um by a and this is a white man, it's a white psychologist, Eric from um, to be or to have. Mm-hmm. And he mentions in the book, he said Europeans superficially embraced Christianity, but they never actually fully practice it because what what Christianity preaches is fundamentally different than Greco Roman culture and Germanic culture. And he mentions, you know, at the root of Christianity is hmm. a sense of martyrdom, a sense of I'm gonna sacrifice myself for, you know, the, the well being of others. That's you know, mm-hmm. what Christ does in, in the gospel. Now he says that's the opposite of the Greco Roman and Germanic religions. I just finished explaining to you. Whereas, you know, Jesus is a God that's sacrificing himself to save humanity. Zeus is a God that's taking advantage of every woman that he can get his hands on. You know, hmm. that's that's their God. So what, what Frum was arguing is that even though superficially Europeans embrace Christianity, the culture that was fundamentally remained the same as it was since the Greco-Roman times. Wow. And, you know, that's kind of that's that's deep because, you know, like even like Dr. Clark, uh, even though he was, you know, making a critique whenever he said, uh, you know, uh, we out Pope the Pope and out Muhammad Muhammad. But I think the, there's another part of that to where as a people you know we have that type of spirit where um 
it's it, we you know in a lot of ways like we we can be selfless like I, and and sacrifice for the greater good and i know that's not the narrative that is shown in any type of mainstream media but you can if you look up the numbers uh i saw that uh i i, was, I saw articles written about you know black people uh in america are you know compared i guess maybe i don't know if it was a per capita thing but you know, spend more on the less fortunate, even when we are the less fortunate, you know what I'm saying? Like, 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 and, um, and so I, I think that, that type of spirit and who we are, um, allows us sometimes to see these religions in a way that the European just can't, because like, if you look at yeah. like, like, look at how they, like this whole rise in, um, right-wing christian fundamentalism it doesn't even have anything to do like i don't i like I, I struggle because i've never sat there and just like watched the watched a sermon or anything from them but you know like what their politics are but the idea of you know keeping america great and voting for donald trump and being against immigration how you assimilate that or or juxtapose that with the teachings of christ I, that's that's some crazy mental gymnastics like but i mean i guess that's what they own yeah and I, that, that, that's a great point um you know about john henry clark because and that's essentially his argument um and, you know i remember he'd make the point that um when it comes to those religions we're the truest believers and then that's why he made that point and he always said you know that the strength of african people is our hospitality. And he said that's that was a weakness as well. And even, you know, talking particularly about these religions, you know, I mentioned when Christianity came to um to to Europe, the first reaction for the Roman Empire was to kill the Christians before they embraced it. So while the Romans were killing Christians, Christians were actually running to Africa for safety and for refuge. Um even in the gospel, um, you know, G Jesus, you know, Jesus went to, to Egypt to escape um mm. persecution. So we're seeing you know, and in a lot of these religious traditions, it's Africa that they're having to go to find safety, to find refuge. Even Islam, the Prophet Muhammad, he went, went to, to Ethiopia. Ethiopia. So, mm -hmm. and, and here's the thing. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this recently because we were um having a build in the organization, and you know, sister in the organization is a Muslim. So we're talking religion. I said, you know, that, think about this. When Prophet Muhammad went to introduce Islam among the Arabs, the Arabs tried to kill him. So he <laughs> had to go to Ethiopia for protection. So the, the irony is, you know, today we think of, we associate Christianity with Europe and Islam with Arabs, but those two groups want to destroy those religions when the religions were first introduced. Mm. It was really Africans that embraced these religions before, you know, those groups mm. did. So that's just, yeah. you know, our history as a people are very you know, hospitable, very open to new ideas. Um, unfortunately, through our history, that's often worked, you know, against us to our disadvantage. You know, they put us in a position where it was a very easy you know, to, to conquer us, but that's just part of the culture. And, and the Donald Trump situation, I, saw, I don't know if you saw <laughs> Donald Trump recently, um, he's selling a Bible. I saw that. It was like, yeah. hold on, hold on. And it was something, but it was like uh, the, uh, hold on, it was like something that had to do with America, like God bless America and only America. Like it was something, weird. hold on, I'm about to find it, because uh, I, I think that's insane actually. Um and, but these are the times that we are living in, and I guess you know that that ugly shoe that he was trying to sell is sold out already. Um, but yeah, they say, it says, uh, "Oh, his Bibles are God bless the USA Bibles, right?" And so yeah. this idea, and it's right. It's so what's so the irony about that is like God bless the USA Bible, right? And these and and USA is the empire. In the Bible, Rome, Rome was the empire. Yeah. Yes, this Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah, so it's like they are look. They and they don't even. I guess they don't no, see. Yeah. They don't yeah. even see the irony in there, right? That's, that's that's a great parallel because I mean, just, just think about you know, America today is the Roman Empire then, and it was the Roman Empire that crucified Jesus. You know, ultimately, crucifixion is a form of the state execution. You know, the, the Roman governor Pontius Pilate had to sign off on you know executing Jesus, so he was killed by the Roman state. Right. So, you know, you see that parallel, and, you know, this is why the, the historical parallel is important, because the same Roman Empire that killed Jesus and killed so many of his followers, they realized eventually, you know, instead of trying to suppress Christianity, we can actually use it to mm. manipulate the people and mm -hmm. some of our purposes. 
And it's the same thing we see now in America. American politicians use, you know, Christianity and um for for their purposes to to manipulate people. And I just to to me, uh, and that's why I would advocate, particularly for people who are religious. If you're a Christian, please read that Bible to understand what's in there. Because the first thing that I think about when I see these people like Donald Trump and these big, you know, mega churches, you know, these multimillionaires that use Christianity and the Bible to um to make their money, you know, it says in the Bible, rich people don't go to heaven. Right, pretty much. There, there's a story with, uh, with Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus goes to heaven because he's poor. The rich man goes to hell be- just because he was rich and he's sharing this wealth of Lazarus. There's another parable where a rich man asks Jesus, you know, what do I need to do to go to heaven? And Jesus says, give away all your wealth. Yeah. And Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to pass <laughs> yep. a needle than right. for a rich man to get into heaven. Now, if, if you look at a needle and how big a camel is, you can see it's pretty difficult to get that camel through a needle. And imagine that's going to be easier than getting a rich person into heaven. So that's why I said, read, read that book because if you are, if you're a conscious Christian who actually understands your teachings, why would you buy a book from a billionaire like Donald Trump? The Bible <laughs> right. tells you what a billionaire is going. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. And I mean, and I, I mean, <laughs> and he's going there just on the basis of being rich. That's not even getting into his personal business. That's not even getting into the stuff he did when he was the president and he was the head of the American Empire. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we, we can say the same thing about Joe Biden as well. Joe Biden's supposed to be Catholic. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you, how do you reconcile Joe Biden's Catholicism with his support for what Israel is doing? Right. Oh well, so so here's a. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, all right, so I saw a clip the other day, and it was um, a, a brother from Palestine, but he lived in the states, right? Um, I believe it was the states. It might have been the UK, but I, I, I can't. I, no, actually, it was the states. And they and there was three brothers that uh, uh, were on the street. Uh, when I say on the street, I mean not not on the street in a negative way. They were just out on the street in New York doing whatever they were doing. And you know how like you're, you're walking. Uh, New York is such a busy place where, you know, you have people doing all types of TV shows and podcasts on the corner. And so they stopped uh, and they uh, they were building with the uh, Palestinian uh, brother. And he asked them, so are you guys... Um, uh, pro-Israel or uh, pro-Palest- pro-Palestinian, like in this, you know, uh, genocide issue that's happening. And um, they were like, we are pro-Israel, right? Young Young black dudes, right? But he ended up educating them. But the reason that they said that is because they said that Israel is where Jesus is from, right? Now, whenever we look at, when we talk about this type of Christian fundamentalism, I'm starting to fear, not all, right? But I'm starting to fear that a lot of these black church would, churches could possibly go down this pro-Zionist path because of the same reasons. Like, what, what do you think? It's interesting you you mentioned that because you know I, I told you in private conversation that I recently started working with um with a church, and the pastor was actually saying that the pastor's pointing out there's some Christians who would not criticize Israel because they feel like oh Israel that's God's nation those are God's chosen people, and like, again this goes back to when you're a Christian you really need to read that book because he pointed out that no that's incorrect when you read the Bible Israel gets punished by God all the time mm-hmm. matter of fact. Because Israel is God, are God's chosen people in the Bible, they get punished by God more than any nation in that right. book because they're God's chosen people. So God has a higher expectation for the Israelites than any other nation. So he's constantly punishing them. So this whole idea that um you have to support Israel as a Christian because that's God's you know, nation, that, that's not even just from a biblical standpoint, that's not accurate. And even just from a, a theological you know standpoint, as a Christian, how, how do you support and justify what Israel has been doing to, to Palestine? Right. Right, it doesn't make sense on a theological, you know, perspective at all. But you know, you're, you're correct because um, I remember you know years ago when I was in college, I discovered that there are black people who support Israel just because they're Christians and they believe um the creation of Israel is the fulfillment of the prophecy. So they mm. have all kinds of religious and theological yeah. justifications for why they support Israel. And isn't that why? And uh, and isn't that some of the justification that um a lot of the people there use for? their settler colonialism for even being there because they're like, Hey, we are the descendants of Abraham and all of this kind of um, stuff. 
And that's interesting. So when it comes to Zionism, there are you know, religious Zionists who would make those arguments that you know, we're just re rec reclaiming the land that God um, promised us, the land that God gave us. Well, what's interesting about that movement is that there's a secular Zionism as well. In fact, you know, the, the, the founder of Herzl, Herzl, yeah. Herzl was, was mm -hmm. an atheist. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Maher, Bill Maher is a big Zionist and he's an atheist. Fact, so, yeah. so even the atheist Zionist, it's not so much a religious justification. It's not a justification of, well, you know, God promised us this land, but it's still this justification of, well, this land originally was ours and we're coming back to retake it. And it was interesting when I saw Bill Maher making that argument because I know for a fact that Native Americans start talking about, well, we were here first, let's you know, <laughs> kick you out of your home and retake some of your land. Mm -hmm. You know, Bill Maher would not, you know, before that, but absolutely out here justifying why you know is you know Israelis are within the right to retake land that. And and here's the thing too about um about the Bible. If you if you're really trying to make a religious justification for um for the Israelis having that land. Well, according to the Bible, it wasn't their land originally. They, they actually had to take it from the Canaanites yep. through warfare and through genocide. Mm -hmm. Facts. Facts. Facts, yeah, right? That's, 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 no, that's, that's, um, yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. Um, and it kind of leads me, um, uh, to the last question I wanted to ask you. Um, you made a post about, uh, Zionism being intertwined. Uh, with Western colonialism in Africa, and especially for a lot of people that, because me, I am, and, and you know, whether some agree or not, I think people pretty much know um, where I stand on that issue, because I'm, I'm always for the uh, oppressed, uh, you know, in, in these type of situations, but um when it comes to Zionism uh, and Western colonialism in Africa, um, could you elaborate on, um, you know, what these connections are? So I always give a very specific example based on the work I've been doing on the continent for several years and I've been involved in the Four Moscow movement. And that's the movement to, um, you know, essentially on seat uh, for Nasingbe who's the, the president of Togo. He'd been the president of Togo since 2005. He wasn't democratically elected. The military had a coup and opposed him as president of Togo after his father died. And his father had been president since the 1960s. So mm -hmm. since the 1960s, the, Togo has been ruled by one family, a father and son a duo. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I made that comment is a big part of why, to, uh, why Ford has been able to remain in power as long as he has in Togo is through support from Western governments. Because... You know, the, 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 typically what happens in Togo is whenever the people actually uh, rise up and there's a protest, you know, demanding that he steps down, he'll send the military to go out and, you know, shoot the protesters and to kill them. But the weaponry that the military uses, the military equipment that, that they have, mm -hmm. it's not produced in Togo. It comes from hmm. you know, other, or other sources. Mm -hmm. The training as well, AFRICOM, you know, trains mm -hmm. um, the military in Togo. So... A big part of why he's able to remain in power to oppress his people uh, is through his connections with other governments. Now, where Israel comes into the picture, Israel and Togo have a very close relationship to the point where when Donald Trump was president and he decided to move the American embassy in um, Israel to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. Togo was the only African country at the United, United Nations to vote in support of Israel and the United States. Wow. Wow. And that the other part of that connection too is there's um there's an Israeli group and actually this group was blacklisted on um, my President Biden not too long ago um the NSO group and they, they create uh, spyware so the Togolese government has actually been using their uh, spyware to spy on activists to spy on opposition leaders so a big part of why the regime in Togo has been able to maintain itself in power is through the support to succeed from from Israel and. The presidents of Togo and Benjamin Netanyahu, they're so close that um, the Israeli Prime Minister um, Netanyahu has actually described for as being a friend. Mm, that's crazy. That's yeah, friend. yeah, that's crazy. And like, and also even here, like, um, I have a, I'm, I have a uh, article. It's from the Intelligencer, Intelligencer, uh, where it talks about uh, this was uh, written in 2012. And it talked about how the NYPD had a branch in Israel. And we know that they have uh, sent some of their soldiers over here 
to train and we've sent uh soldiers and i don't want to say we because i don't have shit to do with that they have sent uh, soldiers over there like my, like my <laughs> said um, you know, we, we don't say our government we say the government yeah facts <laughs> facts but we ain't got nothing to do with that man but you know like it's it's um like like when i you know I, all of this stuff is connected. Western imperialism, it's all connected. Like, you know, like when I saw that um uh, Muta Mutabil of the uh from the outlaws, uh he was in Puerto Rico and uh he had uh showed a picture of uh Puerto Rico um uh flying the Haitian flag and the Palestinian flag and and um blacking out the colors in um the Puerto Rican flag, which I was told was a sign of, you know, uh, anti uh, anti colonial gesture, you know, and and I I just think that people got to understand like the same Western hegemony that is doing whatever doing what it's doing in Palestine is the same that's responsible for Africom. It's the same that is responsible for coups in Latin America. It's the same that is putting blockades and sanctions on nations that choose to have a different form of government. And so it's always connected. You know, um, I, I think <clears throat> it kind of reminds me, I wanted to bring it up then whenever you said it, but it's like when how we were talking about um, history, the way it's taught to us, like I didn't know about the Haitian Revolution in, in in school either, right? But even when we did, even when I did learn it, learn about it, it was from some type of I don't I can't remember where I can't remember where, but I know it wasn't it wasn't from you know Jacob Carruthers or CLR James at this point, um, and there was no mention of how you know, this almost bankrupted France, which caused them and the Louisiana purchase and how all of this was connected. You, you see the, and, and how it had, uh, you know, plantation owners in the South shook and how it, in, in word got around and it inspired, you know, Africans and in, uh, enslaved Africans in America to, you know, continue to fight. And when, when, when we don't see the uh when we don't see the connectedness of the things i think we we really miss out and do ourselves a disservice because within this system all of this is connected you know what i mean i i don't see i i mean there's i mean it just is what it is i mean it, these are the same culprits it's it's america and you know the UK and 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 its minions and stuff over there. Like we we already know. Like these are the people that are responsible for it all, and have been responsible for, before for the last you know five hundred years. And if you can, just you could go ahead and 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 you know close it out with this. Like if you can, just talk about you know like even like whenever we look at Martin and we look at Malcolm and how they saw. Uh, things from an international uh, lens. And many would say that's what got them killed. When we look at the Panthers, uh, you know, they saw things from an international lens. Garvey, not only did he see things from an international lens, he was organizing internationally. Um, but, and so this leads me to believe, well, I know because I've studied them obviously, but that would lead one to believe that they understood the connectedness and of of white hegemony and how it works and just from your standpoint whenever we look at what's happening in this world why do you think it's important to see these things as interlocking uh, uh, events instead of viewing them in isolation I think it's important because they are interlocking. When I wrote my book, uh, Four Must Go, which is about the same movement that I mentioned, one of the points that I make in the book is that you know, a lot of the resources that go towards sustaining sustaining the dictatorship in Togo 
those are resources that could actually be put into some African American communities here. Mm-hmm. We've got a lot of poor, struggling communities um here. You know, particularly I was thinking about um, you know, situations like um, like whenever we see a, a water crisis, you know, Mississippi had one, you know, not too long ago, uh, Flint as well. Mm-hmm. Why why don't we have um more up to date water you know systems in African American communities? Right. So, right. so that's one of the points to make in Fort Moscow, that just resources that could be used here to improve communities here are going towards oppressing African people in Togo. So right there, we see that connection that, you know, American imperialism are neglecting the Africans here to assist in the oppression of African mm, people. Crazy. Abroad. So it's one of those mm. things that you just, you, you'll, you'll always come to a conclusion that these, these things are international and they're interconnected just by understanding the system and understanding how the system works. And you don't even have to be a revolutionary Pan-Africanist to understand that a lot of resources are wasted on American imperialistic foreign policy. Mm-hmm. Like, like look how much resources were, were wasted in Afghanistan to do what? Mm, right. To, 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 so they can come to, back and, in. Yeah, exactly. To, to leave and come back. like And then look at how much they're sending over. First off, I don't even want to talk about what they're sending over to Israel, but look at like they're sending how much money they're sending to Ukraine, right? And 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 it's like these are billions and billions of dollars, but when it comes to something like reparations, they have to do study after study after study to see where the money would come from. If they are thinking of if, if they're if they're talking about infrastructure uh and 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 like you said you know basic necessities like water and flint then they have to you know do these long drawn out studies to see where the money would, would come from they have money for what they want to do and th- what they want to do is continue to consolidate their power and and get rich off of the uh labor and and um and and resources of everybody else man and that's what it is Tupac said that they've got money for wars. Mm. Facts, facts, right there, man. Uh, I mean, that, that's part of it, but it's also important to understand too when we're talking about how these things are you know, interconnected. That, for example, Israel, Israel would not even be in existence if it wasn't for the fact that the Zionists um, aligned with British imperialism, and that's what Kwame Ture was always critical of Zionism over there. He pointed out that liberation struggles were supposed to fight colonialism, mm-hmm. not align with colonialism. So the Zionists had to align with British colonialism. In Palestine, just to build that, that state, and we see this you know, historically, even when we talk about the American Empire. And again, this is why studying history is so important. That th- this American Empire is really an offshoot of the British Empire. That's mm. the British you know, settler mm-hmm. colony. So th- that's how you know th- these things are, are are built and interconnected. For example, the apartheid regime in South Africa that was not a settler, settler colony that was sustained through the support of other you know, Western empires, the United yep. States. Britain. So historically, when we look at all these empires, they're interconnected and they support each other because they have to. Um, Amos Wilson made the point that, and this is important to you know think about this because we we in America we tend to think of African people as being minorities and white people being the majority, but globally, white people are actually a minority. Right. So Amos Wilson always made the point that when you're a minority trying to rule the rest of the world, you're gonna have to rule in a particular way. And part of you know what they did is pray a global international system where white supremacy always supports each other, but at the same time, they create divisions among African people. Mm. And, you know, and in some situations, even, and this is the point you're supposed to make, some, in some situations, even recruit African people to serve the empire. Absolutely. Like we saw that, the, like the head of AFRICOM, you know, like yes. it's, it's not a coincidence they have a black face on that. You know what I'm saying? Um, um, but yeah, man, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Uh, Brother Dwayne, um, Man, I always appreciate, you know, the bills we have on and off camera, man. Um, I appreciate I, get to, uh, I don't even think half of the question. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. We didn't, we didn't. So, you know, we're gonna have to do another one. But um uh now nah, this this was dope, man. I, I always appreciate uh you coming through, bro. Um if you wanna um, you know, let everybody know how to uh, find you on uh, your socials and how to find your articles and your books. Go ahead and let the people know. Yeah, I'm uh, Amazon. You're just you know, putting my name into uh, Dwayne Wong on Wally. Everything is you know there on Amazon. Um, yeah, Facebook, um, X as well. I, I'm still not accustomed to you know being called X. I, in my head, it's still Twitter. So. No doubt. And I'll make sure I put all the links and stuff at the bottom. Um, yeah, but I again, try to stay fairly active on, on social media so you, you can reach me there. 
Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely, man. Again, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you for all the hard work that you do for our people and educating us. And, and not only that, um, the boots on the ground work that you do, man, it's all appreciated, bro. Thank you. Appreciate it. Peace.